There will always be resistance. The next battle will always be near. As long as you have everything, there will be those who have nothing to fear. Our future is not yours to choose. Welcome to Voices of Resistance. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. The viewpoints expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder, or the staff. I'm Barbara Humphrey. And I'm Albert Strickland. Co-hosts of today's show. Voices of Resistance is a project of the Savannah Justice and Peace Collective. We give voice to resistors who have no voice in mainstream media and present a wide range of issues that affect us all. But there will always be resistance. The next battle will always be near. As long as... Welcome to Voices of Resistance. This is Wednesday, November 29th, 6 p.m., and here we are. I'm Barbara. And I'm Albert. I'm Phoenix. And we have Savannah on the board again. Yes, Savannah Savannah on the board. Thank you. Yes. So in advance of World AIDS Day on Friday, we decided we would have a conversation about the gay rights movement. And... um, we're going to be talking about um, going back a little bit in history, but mostly kind of current stuff, particularly since um, <laughs> current for some of us, at least, maybe before many of you were born. <laughs> but yes. we'll see. So, um, you know, when I look at the history, I think we've certainly come a long way, but we definitely have a long way to go. Um, when we look back into the 18th, 19th, and even the early 20th century, um, there were an incredible um, plethora of laws and um, mores and customs that were um, quite discriminating against people who um, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and um, also some laws that criminalized um, homosexuality. People could actually be sentenced to death. And um, it seems like the only exception to all these rules was, um, was the arts. So in a Shakespearean play, a man was allowed to cross-dress because women weren't allowed to be in the plays. You were not allowed to be an actor. You were not allowed to be an actor. But other than that, there was really, there were, there, th- that, was about, that was about all. And there were a few reformers along the way who talked a little bit about um, you know, um, what was the point? Um, and particularly, particularly this guy, Jerry Me- Me Betham, who had an argument that said the morality of an action should be determined by the net consequence of that action on human well-being. And if that were the way we judged all our actions, wouldn't this be a wonderful world? You know, what do you think? Well, of course it would be. Um, what was the first nation to decriminalize being homosexual? I don't know. Does anybody out there want to take a guess? The first nation to decriminalize homosexuality. It happened in 1791. Um, Was it France? I Ah, think you got it. It was France indeed, yes. So Phoenix got the answer. Yes, it was France. And it was part of the French Revolution and change and... um, you know, but even then, then we had the Victorian era. And if any of you uh, remember the Victorian ever, uh, era... I, I don't would, remember it totally, <laughs> just bits and pieces. But, uh, yeah, the Victorian era was uh, the age of hypocrisy almost. Yes. You know, it uh, was an interesting time. It was uh, uh, wrong to, to be human almost in almost. those days. And everything was set by a certain standard and rules. And That's you had right. to comply. And if you didn't, you were sick, ill, or something yep. wrong with you. yeah. So anybody who was really looking to reform, particularly um, 
in the air in in the area of um, not your typical um, homogenous relationships and families you really had to do it underground and you had to create um, groups and societies that had names that had absolutely nothing to do with what you were trying to do which um, they were a lot of these these groups uh, uh, we even have some of them in the fraternities and things that yeah. had nothing to do with what they were about nothing but, uh, nothing uh, at all that's just right hide yep <laughs> Can and you give us an example well, an example, let's see, we have the Britain's Order of Chironia. What's Chironia? <laughs> well, I think it had something to do with one of the wars. Maybe it was a battle where um, someone was stopped at the gates, and I'm not quite sure who now. But this was actually a order for gay social people to get together. That, well, it was social reformers pushing ahead. It oh, mostly oh. in secret during the Victorian era, yes. Gay people getting together. So this, but this was specifically for politics, though. Um, no. When I, you I say social reform? Well, social reform, I don't consider, I consider politics civil reform. When you, when you, oh, in a political arena, when you change the laws. So this was just people trying attitudes. to change the, the attitudes of the people yes. around them. Yes, I see. Um, and then there was, in the U.S., there, was a, there were secret or semi-secret groups formed to advance rights of homosexuals well into the 20th century, such as the Society for Human Rights. Can't get more bland than that now, can you? Who would be against human rights, Who right? would be against human rights? Mm -hmm. A know. lot of people, as yeah. it turns out. Let's start down the well, line. <laughs> I bet if you change the name of that group to Society for Gay Human Rights, it you might have, have quite an outcry. Right. So... In the, um, in the 1940s, 1945 to be exact, there was a movement that came along called the homophile movement. And um, they used the word homophile instead of homosexuality because they wanted to emphasize love over sex. And this was an interesting movement. These were people who believed that um, the best way for people to get ahead and be accepted was to assimilate. So don't look what you are, don't act what you are, you know, do it all behind closed doors and assimilate into the larger society. And I'm sure we've heard that before with certain groups trying to make it and get ahead. And um, we may all have some views on that. But well, when you have a dominant group and you have to be part of that group in order to survive yes. or to advance in any mm -hmm. way, it kind of puts pressure on you. You have to be part of their group That's or right. else you have nothing. Oh, you have nothing. And, uh, if you have no power, you have no access to money, you have no access to survival, you That's right. assimilate as That's best right. you can. But it's very difficult and I, uh, to, to be forced to assimilate, right. to me, is, is criminal. You lose who you are as a person That's and right. you are all at once That's right. becoming something you are not putting on a show when you're around these other people. That's right. And you must be constantly living in fear that you're going to somehow be outed that somehow something is going to happen and you're going to be found out. And what a way to live. That, that's, that certainly isn't human. Um, and with, there were two groups that um, stood out in the homophil um, era. One was called the Mattachine Society, and it was formed to unify homosexuals, educate them, provide leadership, and assist people with legal troubles. The focus of this group was clearly assimilation and respectability. It had a companion group, Daughters of Belitis, and um, if anybody out there happens to know what that name refers to, or if it has a specific reference, please let us know. Um, this was a group for lesbians in San Francisco and developed very similar goals to the Mattachine Society. Uh, there was a purpose in trying to prove that gays could be assimilated into society, that they could do this with non-confrontational education aimed at both homo and heterosexuals, and local activists who saw, however, who saw what civil rights and anti-war movements were doing started having some very different ideas. Well, there's always been this, this problem between those who want to to be out there to really yes. force the issue and then mm -hmm. there those who say no 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 we can't do that we've got right. to play the game right. and go along this was true of the uh, women's suffrage movement yeah. there were those who wanted it and they wanted to do anything to get it that was necessary and then there were those who said no let's play the game right. let's talk to the president one time or let's 
Let's write our senator yes. one more time. Let's, or let's register do this. to vote. That's right. And register to vote. That was a big one. We can vote this thing away. Yep. But when the cards are stacked against you, uh, there is no voting going to take care of that. So you you yeah. do eventually, even the civil suffrage movement, had to go out and be arrested and imprisoned and do actions that they normally wouldn't like. Yeah, that's true. And I'm I'm one who's always been known to say it has to get worse before it gets better. And perhaps it was the absolute repression of the post-World War II, mostly 1950s and early 1960s. For Cold example, War era. Cold War era. We have talked about Senator Joseph McCarthy and his hearings in search of communists, but he also targeted others that were deemed un-American. And um, do you remember who those groups might have been? Well, this was, so the, the Red Scare is what you call the, the scare against the communists and socialists, and then the Lavender Scare is what you call the part where people who were gay or non, non-gender conforming would be associated with. Absolutely, absolutely. And you found yourself outside society, outside the social norm. Oh, yeah, you could get, you could lose, were. if you were... In Hollywood, for example, you could like be blacklisted and lose your job. That was a really big deal. Absolutely. Um, and then also Absolutely. other places of power and things We like watched that. Uh, a movie last night. Uh, it was called uh, The True, the uh, Normal Heart. And in this movie, um, it could not have happened in the 50s or the 40s or no, the 30s. No, not at all. Uh, because even an actor portraying a gay person was marginalized and pushed out. Right. For the most part. Absolutely. So that's why they, they protected that masculinity yep. so much. Rock Hudson is a good right. example. Right. You know, you have to hide who you are in that's order right. to, to make it in the world. And that's so right. he did. I, I mean, think about some of these things that were happening in the 50s. Homosexuals were listed by the U.S. State Department as a security risk. Mm. Suspe- if you applied for uh, a status uh, for a government job that required a security clearance, if you were homosexual, you would not get it. That's no. for sure. And suspected homosexuals were either denied or fired from federal jobs, regardless of security clearance, and discharged from the military. The FBI and local police kept lists lists of known homosexuals, their establishments, and their friends. Heavy on the establishments. Yes. They watched you. Yes, they watched you. The post office kept lists of addresses where materials pertaining to homosexuality were being mailed. Now, that's something I didn't know. But the post office kept list if, if you were receiving something pertaining to uh, gay uh, rights or gay anything actually you would be put on this list the post office did that the post office did that and you would think that you had a, a right to receive whatever you you wanted to in the mail but but the post office was a uh, actually federal thing at the, at at the, the time, time right? yes yeah. well they yeah did this to keep track and to track people hey right, well we don't put that past them and uh, that was actually a huge inspiration um, later on uh, for with with the racial segregation that we did Same and the thing. categorization, yeah. and that's what Hitler used for a lot of what he was using in, in Nazi Germany was that's trying right. to use the same well, systems we right. use here. Actually, I, I had a teacher once tell me that much of what Hitler did he patterned after U.S. policy. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, he certainly we were very good at it. Yes, so we were very you good go at after it. the best, follow and the best. That's right, and we were great at it in the 50s. We had cities performing sweeps to rid neighborhoods, parks, bars, and beaches of gay people. <laughs> we did that here in Savannah. Yeah. The, the one thing from the, the 60s and the 70s, I mean, there were sweeps all the time, and especially since at this time Savannah was not the tourist mecca that it is mm-hmm. now. And in order to uh, to make the city seem something different, they would have these sweeps, and especially before it Elections. Oh that was my a big yes. thing. You mm-hmm. tough on crime or tough on or if you those know gays t- hanging out in areas. That's right. Or a big so tourist the weekend. Sweep and arrest them. Were mm-hmm. you telling me earlier that police used to have things at your schools about this? Oh well, yeah. Well, no, not about this, but in the fifties, uh, especially the police and the uh, uh, other agents would come through with these government-created films, and they would tell you, "You got to watch out for those gay people." Uh, they're going to <laughs> steal your children or make your children gay or they're convert going to murder your children. Your children or it was all kinds of things because it was considered a mental illness yep. uh, at that time. So if you were mentally ill, you were not to be trusted as a member of society. That's it really was listed as such in the uh, psychiatric uh, manuals. Yeah. It, it, it's horrifying to imagine that sort of reality where <laughs> you have the police coming into schools to tell people this and to, to enforce this sort of discrimination. In fact, we saw that in the other movie we watched night before last. What was the name of yeah, that Yeah, Stonewall. One? Stonewall. 
in in which uh, this kid, uh, his teacher was the his coach was his father, and uh, his father uh, he knew he was gay, so he right. brought these people in to come and talk about how evil it is and don't trust mm. anyone and you've got to be very careful around these people. It's hard to imagine for, I imagine, young gay people today it is. that something like that could happen. Right. But this is not that many years no. ago, actually. Imagine that wearing opposite gender clothing was outlawed. <laughs> I mean, this is almost almost hard I'll, to imagine. I'll, do you know, when I went to high school here in Savannah, of course, uh, you could not wear pants to school if you were... A, a, a female at all. Yeah. It was forbidden. Uh, you'd be sent home or you would be expelled from school right. for wearing pants to school. And uh, in North Dakota, I mean, not North Dakota, what is it, Montana, waiting on a school bus, you had to wear dresses and skirts in the middle of winter. That's you right. You could not wear pants. And they wouldn't even allow you to wear them even with a skirt That's over right. the top. Up in that Yankee state of New York, you had to wear skirts in the wintertime, and, and it was pretty actually, cold. A lot of people actually were frostbitten. By That's this right. It sort was pretty, pretty mm -hmm. cold. Hard uh, to imagine, so isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, and how did we get? How did we get here? From we were talking about. Oh, because you couldn't even have. Uh, you couldn't even have the opposing uh, clothing. That's what this comes down right. to. It's like right. you, if you you couldn't. You, you had to conform to your gender That's roles. Right. That's right. That's right. So. Women, we have come a long way. We can now wear pants, even <laughs> men's pants, men's shirts. Yeah, I had a friend once who said she only bought men's yes. jeans because they were the only ones that fit properly yep. and they had right. pockets. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, like I just bought, bought a pair of men's hiking boots Yeah. because they're roomier. They give your toes more rooms to wiggle. Yeah. Yes. And I think a significant thing, the American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. I mean, this is the Bible in, me in medicine, you know. This is where you look up symptoms to come up with diagnoses. This is where it's determined whether, you know, health care will pay for certain treatments. Um, and it, it might understand this is tied in a lot with the pharmaceutical industry as well because you're supposed to use the categories that are described here to give Prescri certain prescriptions for well yeah that's certain yeah. that certainly is part of it i mean it's certainly you know if you go to the doctor and and you it's determined you have a condition it's covered differently under some medical insurance and if you just go and homosexuality was um was c considered a pathological hidden fear of opposite sex of the opposite sex caused by traumatic parent child so for just being gay you would be given uh, psychiatric drugs. That's right. You you were considered to have a mental disorder. And, you know, there was also a lot of talk at that time about converting people, about counseling and, you know, yeah, that's that was the way it was in the 50s and up until the 60s. What was the thing we heard? There are still churches that believe you can pray the gay away. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. The pray that's the gay a very away. traumatic um, thing for a lot of people, I believe. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Imagine the trauma. Imagine the trauma. Um... So when you think about the repression of the 50s and early 60s, it's not hard to imagine how all of this built up anger at um, being so badly shamed, about being so badly repressed, about not being able to get work, about not being s accepted. Um, certainly people, you know, gay and lesbian people wound up living in enclaves, Greenwich Village and Harlem in New York City. And Christopher Street. Christopher Street in New York City in the village mm -hmm. and, and in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. There Castro were places Street where people would go because they felt safe. Well, a lot of this time, you know, when you were d discovered that you, you were, someone discovered that you were gay, uh, many times parents would actually, uh, what do you call it? Throw the children you. out of the yeah, house. Yeah, that's still a thing now. Never want to see you again. You're out of my right. life. I don't know who you right. are. And where are these kids, some of them high school age, where are they going? They have no money, no place to go. They don't have a high school education yet, many of them. And so they end up on these streets, whether it's Seattle or whether that's it's Atlanta right. or that's right. even Savannah or not too long ago uh, from the surrounding area. You don't know what you're going. You have no, no place to stay. So you end up staying in alleyways or s uh, you're homeless. And, and imagine, um, particularly if you've got a very pretty face, what kind of work you're going to wind up doing. I mean, these are boys off the farms. Yeah. You know? You know, and so at least at that time, you start seeing things changing. In fact, in 1958, the U.S. Postal Service was was required by the U.S. by the Supreme Court to um, 
send out specifically uh, to send out uh, literature specifically aimed at gays, homosexuals, and lesbians. Um, yeah. Well, there was a magazine. There was a being magazine published called One, yes. and the post office refused to deliver it because it was gay oriented. So they refused. So they w took them to the Supreme Court. They won the case, mm -hmm. and the post office had to deliver the magazines whether they wanted to or not. That's and right. And since then, a whole range oh, of ideas. Now, there. it was perfectly all right to deliver Playboy and all these other right. things, but it was not all right, right. to deliver right. one. And some of us remember the brown paper that things were wrapped in, so oh, you didn't yeah. see them. So there were other things popping up. There were people who were starting to protest, particularly in San Francisco and New York, police harass harassment, the police coming and moving people along, um, bothering them in public spaces, which should be part of the commons that we all have a right to. Um, one thing in particular that was happening in New York was that there were a number of establishments that were um, opened and welcomed um, gay, homosexual people. Um, many of them, or some of them, such as the Stonewall Inn in Greenwich Village, did not have a liquor license, lost their liquor license, but continued to serve. And it was a little game that the owners, in this case the mafia, and the police played, where they would stage... Um, sweeps once a week they would come in and they would you know chastise the owner for serving <laughs> alcohol they would round up some of the people in the establishment and arrest them and then there was an exchange of money between the owner and the police and they went away and then they came up the following week and that was what uh, the gambini family gambino family gambino. i believe was the family mm. that they mentioned but but you didn't hear that from us now did you <laughs> um yeah so um this is, this, this is the picture. Um, places like Philadelphia, there was something called the Compton's Cafeteria Riots where San Francisco drag queens, hustlers, and transvestites were tired of, pa they were coming into the cafeteria and they were tired of the patrons harassing them and insulting them. And they finally said, we're not going to take this anymore. And they had a, um, a demonstration, shall we say. It's called a riot, but my guess is it was a demonstration. Um, in England in 1967, um, homosexual acts were decriminalized, but only acts between two men over 21 in private. So you just had to be behind closed doors. And um, then in 1967, Columbia University in New York City recognized um, that they actually had gay students in their midst, and they <laughs> had a student homophile league, the first college in the U.S. to officially recognize a gay group. So um, we're marching along, aren't we? Uh, and then there was a Sexual Freedom League in San Francisco for bisexuals. So in June of 1969, in New York City, at this place called the Stonewall Inn, which was this place with no liquor license that welcomed gays, lesbians, transgenders, that drag queens. That was run by the mafia run by and the mafia. made money off all this. And to make it even worse, drinks were watered down. So. Watered down <laughs> drinks um, probably cost an incredible amount because, of course, they had to raise money in order to pay off the police. Um, and, and sadly enough, it was one of the few establishments that welcomed gays. In fact, I had read it was the only, and this seems hard to believe, the only establishment in New York City where gays could come and dance. I mean, it, it seems yeah. impossible. But then um, I had read that um, these raids, and particularly these crackdowns in the early 60s, were tied to the cleanup of New York City in, in, in preparation for the 1964 World's Fair. And um, it many began of, then. Yeah. Many of you don't even know that we have World's Fairs, but they were a big thing at that time. And... Um, you know, they they came to the Stonewall Inn on June 28, 69. It was actually an unscheduled raid, un, unexpected. And um, what happened was uh, the people were tired. The people who were patrons to this place, who were p paying too much for water drinks, were tired of the harassment, tired of the abuse. And um, ironically, what was it, four or five police showed up? Yeah, it was something, uh, the police showed up anyway for this unscheduled raid, and uh, it was a shock to everyone, because yes. everyone knew that the police were being paid off, Right. and so they shouldn't have had this other raid, so they were all upset about it, this is this other, another time that they were harassed, and finally, like a lot of people, you, you get tired of it, 
Yep. And so they like did. They got it. tired of it. And they started picking up anything they could find. They started you know, to throw rocks or anything they could find at the police. And police were injured. They barricaded themselves That's into right. the stone wall. <laughs> And uh, it continued. They smashed windows. They yep, and this, they did. and then even after the police did escape with their life. Uh, well, not before calling in their tactical patrol force right. to That's a rescue them. SWAT unit. Yes, a SWAT unit. But the protests continued the next night, and the night after that, and the night after that. And Four nights. Um, if you think it, uh, if you remember your history, that was when the civil rights movement was becoming more and more active it was people saying we're not going to take this anymore we're not just going to behave well and hope everybody loves us we're going to stand up for what is right for what we believe in and the anti-war movement the same thing things were coming were becoming much more action oriented well if you've noticed uh, actually the only time you really get honest change is when there is a threat that uh, things aren't going to go on the way they want to, as long as they can keep you under control and take just right. be patient. It will come in time. Just be patient. Sure, you women will get the right to vote. I can't work on it right now, but that I will. It'll it'll happen. And you blacks, you'll get the right to vote. Don't worry about it. It'll just take time. That was Johnson's thing to adopt right. King. And the same is true, but it was only the threat of r- radical a- change, Radicals. radical actions mm-hmm. that threatened them and made them push harder. They wanted to keep these people that were the leaders at the time in control because the more radicals might come in and they might actually cause trouble and do something. And they didn't want that. And that's true with any movement. The that's anti-war right. movement for the same thing. If we had just marched and carried signs and that's it, went home, made our grilled cheese sandwiches, <laughs> they have nothing to fear. That's right. It's like their introductory songs, you know. <laughs> If, as long as they have nothing to fear, there's not going to be any change. No, so exactly that, like um, our song. This uh, gay liberation front, is this an example of some of these people that stood <laughs> up and... Yeah, so... Sort so of, not right. exactly. Sort of, but not no. exactly. So Stonewall <laughs> was really considered as kind of the um, pivotal event leading to the gay liberation movement. It was the first time that people had really stood up en masse and fought and came back day after day after day. And, and did property damage. And did property damage and um, refused to accept what was going on. So, yes, after Stonewall, so Stonewall closed in 1971, but the movement continued. Um, and one of the ways it initially continued was in 1970 with the first gay rights marches and parades. New York City's was the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade well, in recognition of the location of the Stonewall Inn on Christopher Street. Actually, the, 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 the first gay march was in Philadelphia That's in 62. Right. That's right. That's right. But, um, yeah. So this was sort of... Wait, but that one wasn't in New York. This was... That was in Philadelphia. And, yeah. and, yeah. and so I bet 10,000 people weren't there. Yeah, and it didn't, it, it didn't exactly continue. I mean, it was no, just a one-time No, it did thing. not. So the Christopher Street Liberation Day Parade in June to mark the first anniversary of the Stonewall Rebellion attracted 10,000 people. That's quite a large amount. And shortly after the Stonewall, um, the Stonewall Rebellion, the American Psychiatric Association decided that homosexuality perhaps wasn't a mental disorder. They <laughs> removed it from their DSM. So... Um, that was that was a good thing, and as Phoenix said, there were um, gay activist organizations and newspapers that came about to get everybody moving, to bring people together, and to get them moving for acceptance, for um, civil rights, for social acceptance. Well, as you said earlier, too, this was a time when the civil rights. We got to this. Here, we'll, we'll, we can get right back to that. I think. Okay, so um, first thing I'm going to do is identify who we are and why we're here. So we're Voices of Resistance on WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We're Savannah Soundings, community radio with global soul. 
This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Brighter Day Natural Foods, offering produce, vitamins, and supplements, and a deli and juice bar. Brighter Day is located at 1102 Bull Street at the south end of Forsyth Park. More information available at 912-236-4703 or brighterdayfoods.com. If you enjoy our programming on WRUULP, please support the station with a donation. As an individual, you can give any amount, become a basic station member, or become a serious fan of the station. To check out membership rates and to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org slash individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Again, to donate to the station, go to www.wruu.org slash individual and select to donate monthly or subscribe to an annual membership. Thank you for listening to and supporting WRUULP. Actually, back to the point, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, the gay movement actually started moving towards a larger movement. It started working with the anti-war movement. It started That's working right. with the liberation, uh, the uh, uh, civil rights movement. And uh, people started joining together. Now, this frightened everyone in Washington and actually around the world because now it's beginning not only to to uh, uh, mount an attack, but to join other people that were upset with things that were going on. So it was very important that that happened. And I remember I was at the demonstration in 71 when the uh, Vietnam vets against the war joined with like 500,000 people. And I remember seeing the Friends of Dorothy there, and there was probably several hundred of them, all dressed up like Dorothy from The Wizard of Oz. It was a sight to see. It was really impressive. And uh, it, we could all work together for this social justice, no matter what you were. Yeah, and I amazing. Hope, you know, that anyway, it was, it was a beautiful yeah. sight. So before we went on our station break, or just as we went on our uh-huh. station break, I was reminded that I didn't tell you why we're here. Yeah. So in case you haven't figured it out yet, why we're here every week is to try to get people to understand where we've, where we've come from in a whole variety of ways, where we are, and hope to stimulate the thought that this is where we need to go, and these are the kind of actions that can be used as voices of resistance, as actions of resistance. Resist. We're Resist. not taking it anymore. That's right. And Phoenix, you mentioned the Gay Liberation Front. Did you want to talk about that? Oh, uh, actually, no. I, I was hoping to learn some more about oh. them. Oh, we've got these notes here, and I saw that they were, one of the things that also set them apart was that they were interested in restructuring society as opposed to simply assimilating into it. That's right. But then there was another group that uh, that formed out of disillusionment with this group. What, what happened? With that? Well, it sounded to me from what I read, and again, this is not something I have a great, I wasn't there at the time to be part of these groups. It sounded like the Gay Liberation Front had great intentions, but they came together and talked a lot and didn't do much. And there were people who became disillusioned with all the talk and no action. And out of that grew this great gay activist alliance. But both of these organizations were incredibly significant because they were really the first organizations that used the word gay in their title. And there was a fight about and that there as was well. A fight. When they were going to send out these uh, envelopes, uh, these letters to everyone trying to get people to involved, uh, they initially started with the gay uh, word in there and the big fight at the board meetings was we can't do that that's we can't right. do that we that's have to take right. that out because people won't support us if they find out we're gay <laughs> or that's the whole point of supporting in the first what if place? we have a kid on our mailing list and he lives with his parents and his and parents take the, the mail in and see that word whatever kind of havoc will we create and um well, that's think, actually a pretty fair <laughs> concern yeah, yeah. i know i agree well, i agree Um, So the Gay Activist Alliance, I just want to mention this because I thought it was kind of cool. They developed this tactic they called ZAP. So they would show up at press conferences where um, politicians were, I don't know, cutting a ribbon for a bridge or a park (laughs) or whatever. Whatever it is they were there to talk about. And they would get in their face. They would catch them off guard, get in their face, and force them to acknowledge that they had gays and lesbians living in their area, in their district, in their city. And to acknowledge that these people deserved their civil rights and social acceptance. 
So we should think about Zap. I like that. I like the yeah. Zap. Well, I, I I see it also in the glitter bombing. Remember the glitter bombing? Oh, we thing? did just learn that glitter is really bad for the environment. It but, probably is. But yeah, go but on. At that point in time, you have these right wing politicians there who are anti everything, anti individual rights. And they'd be giving their spiel, mm-hmm. and all at once, That's this right. person walks up to them with a handful of glitter. And oh, glitter. that is great, though. I know. I do yeah, love so, that. Great yeah. so now we have well. to find environmentally friendly glitter. <laughs> I, I, they will. <laughs> they will. It's going to yeah. happen. We will. It'll be great. We will. We are the <laughs> activists. You're it's right. kind of yes. like the old, <laughs> the old pie in the face type The revolution yes. will have environmentally friendly glitter. Yes. But they were doing something rather than just meeting and talking now. That's right. That they were good. doing something. And that, that was what was important. And the doing something, you know, some of us sitting here today thinking, you know, what were they doing? But it's hard to remember where you came from uh, when you're someplace very different. So after Stonewall, in 1977, the Supreme Court ruled that transgender women could play tennis in the U.S. Open. That was a big fight. That was a big fight. That was a very big fight. And we had some openly gay individuals elected to political office, including Harvey Milk, who was elected as the San Francisco City Supervisor. Well, we had openly gay. That's the word you used. Because we had politicians back in the 50s and 60s and 70s who were as gay as anyone. We had the mayor of New York, for instance, like it or not. Mr. Uh, Koch, 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 Koch himself, yes. He and, and half his staff was probably, they were gay, but they resisted any attempt That's right. to help That's the, right. the, the people who were dying of AIDS even at That's that time. Right. And I worked on political elections in New York. In fact, one of the, one of the candidates that I worked with for a short time um, was a nice guy, not married, and there were rumors circulating <laughs> that perhaps he was gay. And uh, my frustration you know, it was like, so what? So if you are, say it. And if you're not, say it. But don't be fearful of it. And I had well, another politician up north when I would um, introduce the person I was living with as my partner. Oh, aren't you afraid to say that? People will think you're gay. I, I mean, there was just such stigma attached to these things. But Harvey Milk and his um, aide, Gilbert Baker, did something pretty amazing. Yeah, we all see these flags are around town, you know, and all across the world now. This uh, gay liberation flag, right? The rainbow flag. It's the called rainbow other, flag. Other names for it as well. But it was designed by Gilbert Baker. He actually dyed the materials and sewed it to make the first flag used yes. in New York. And it was, uh, it took off from there. Now it's everywhere. Now it's everywhere. He I was channeling. Have a tie. It's the, That's you know, right. The, the, the he was channeling tie. Betsy Ross. <laughs> 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 and he created a symbol that's gone around the world. It has indeed. Yes, because it has. before that time, there was really no standard or no symbol no. to denote anything. Right. We had the pink triangle. We had the you know all this sort of thing. But that was from Hitler's days in concentration camps. Uh, but it was still used. There was a uh, when I was in Seattle. It was a bar in Seattle called the Pink Triangle, and it was that symbol because wow. that's how. And you I had never seen that. Could designate gay, but now. But this now, whole movement now has an emblem that's around the world. Even Russia, when they have the the uh, gay uh, uh, gay pride events, all eight of them in Russia <laughs> got together and <laughs> wow. had their banner and their flags. And, and then what did they do? Disappear off the street? Yeah, they did immediately because, immediately because, because they would have been yes. Uh, you wanted to do. And there were some civic civil um, victories as well. Um, in 1994, there came about this anti-hate crime law. So if, if there had been a, um, a um, you could impose, a judge could impose a harsher sentence if a crime was motivated by a victim's sexual orientation. And um, that law was um, extended and penalties increased under the Matthew Shepard Act. And if you don't remember, Matthew Shepard was a young man who had found his way into Wyoming and um, he was um, pistol whipped, tortured, and tied to a fence and left to die and um, because of his perceived homosexuality. Very, very sad and serious thing. And that actually affected the whole world, yes. that, that death. It really absolutely uh, did. Uh, it absolutely did. Matthew Shepard. Yep. And in 2003, the Supreme Court struck down anti-sodomy laws in Texas. And sodomy was a law that was used to criminalize 
homosexuality, even though we discovered as part of our research, sodomy is not is not related to homosexuality. No, it's just it's used exclusively. Exclusively, yeah. it's just used. Um, so, but then th- now it's not le- that is not a law anywhere though. Since two thousand three, uh, right. the Supreme Court made it so that there's no anti sodomy laws in the whole country. Yes. So, if you happen to know a state or a locality where they are enforcing this kind of law, just think about two thousand three Supreme Court. It's not legal. It should not be done. Yeah. It's, it, it, what Contact you said. your local ACLU. Um, yeah, so the police don't do anything that's illegal, right? Well, yeah, I'm sure that I've seen this on booking <laughs> list actually since 2003, but mm, and just I, keep an eye out for it. That's right. And I don't know if you all felt the earth shake a little bit in two, 2015 and then again in 2017 when the Boy Scouts of America first lifted <laughs> their ban against openly gay leaders and employees and then lifted the ban against transgender boys. You know, that's the one thing that's always I've never quite understood. The Girl Scouts never had that never. Uh, sternness about them. No. Only the Boy Scouts did. And S- the sternness? Yeah, well, sternness. Well, the Girl Scouts I mean, they, were more inclusionary. Yeah. They did not um, discriminate. They did not ban certain girls from becoming Girl Scouts. Uh, it just wasn't like there. The Boy were Scouts the Girl did. Scouts let, let uh, transgender, like, Kids come in into there were no ranks. bans. There were no bans against it. Hmm. Yeah. The Boy Scouts did. Well, the I know Boy the Scouts Boy Scouts did. did. I don't think the Girl Scouts did. So you can't really talk about the gay rights movement and 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 um, being gay without talking about AIDS. Even though AIDS is not a gay disease, it was first. Well, that needs to be said over and over again. Yes, it is absolutely. not a gay disease. Absolutely. Never has been. It's caused by a virus. It's believed that the virus um, originated in non-human primates, and um, we're not quite sure how that happened. There's been some talk about the the bush monkey people who hunted and sold monkey meat to eat. Could have been and the blood vendors. That and sells, the vendors, right? Yeah, it could have so. could have been a blood bloodborne, um, and and that way, but. The first, the first case of AIDS, which of course wasn't called AIDS at the time, was three previously healthy homosexual men became infected with a rare type of pneumonia and a relatively rare form of cancer. Both were, both um, indicated a dysfunctioning or non-existent immune system. So it kind of alerted them to something new along was coming along. It was first referred to as GRID, (laughs) gay-related immunodeficiency. But luckily, as the research progressed, um, it was changed to acquired immune deficiency syndrome in 1981. And this was just kind of evidence that um, when it showed up, it wasn't wasn't gay-specific. And in 1982, we had the formation of what was the gay men's health crisis in New York City. And I remember years ago working with them, and they had great educational materials. And there's where there was the fight at the board table about using the name gay, that they they were horrified. They had a mailing to get out in an hour, and there they're looking at the return address, and people are going ballistic. You know, we can't do this. We can't do this. No one will support us. One of them said we could use magic markers and just write it out. 10,000 envelopes. Oh, my God. And we should all be very thankful they didn't do that, Mm -hmm. you know. In um, 1983, uh, they identified the retrovirus that kills the T cells and um, and creates AIDS, and that uh, and this was called the human immunodeficiency virus. So HIV HIV AIDS became the terminology that was used, and. as we read more about it and learned more about it and thought more about it, um, it was kind of sad at the beginning. I mean, I remember knowing from my history that if somebody had gotten right on this when those first five individuals had been infected and really, really did some serious, serious research instead of turning the other way, including the gay community that turned the other way, things could have been so different. It perhaps could have been stopped right there. But that's not sadly what happened. This was the 1980s. Uh, Ronald Reagan was president, and um, it was another one of those 1950s eras of um, 
not a good time. Not a good time in this country. And um, as people were continuing to show signs of infection and dying, the federal government refused to acknowledge that this existed as a serious and significant illness. They did not appropriate money for research or take any active me me measures to contain the disease. And as Albert said, even in New York City, with a gay mayor, they yeah. refused. Well, yeah, actually, it was surprising to me that the gay community itself turned its back on it. The leadership or the, uh, yeah. what you call it, aristocracy earlier today. Yes, the dinks. Uh, not wanting to admit that it was a gay disease or, you know, not wanting to really push it, push it in any way. And uh, that was a, a major problem, a right. setback. They couldn't right. have any power to push the C, uh, CD, uh, CDC or anyone else to really fully investigate or right. find this. And we went to the politicians. They didn't want anything to do with it either. And it was all out of a fear and shame type. Fear and uh, shame. Uh, I mean, these were people who felt like they were finally being able to come into their own, finally being able to, they had made to some strides. extent, made strides, stepped out of the closet, were starting to enjoy life. And now here comes this disease that is going to make it dirty and and illness causing to be a gay person having sexual act engaged in sexual activities so but there was I a strong effort not to acknowledge this and deal with it i do have to say there's always been a divide yes uh, within the gay community you have the uh, the haves talk to us about the, the dinks tell us who they are double income no kids You've got money, you've got power, you buy the big houses, you get your designer dog, you get this sort of thing. You have money. Uh, uh, most gay uh, people at the time that I was coming up, uh, that wasn't possible because you couldn't actually move into a neighborhood if they knew you were gay in the first That's place. Right. Then. So there That's were a lot right. of strides, uh, a lot of uh, strides made, but those strides were for those who have. That's always the case. And it left a lot, right. of, uh, left a lot people of people behind. behind. The pl people that the, the police were sweeping up in the parks or sweeping up in, the, they were yep. left That's out right. with nothing. And That's that right. so Just like, I mean, it's in different ways, but like when we were talking about this before, it's all forms of discrimination are ultimately, they, they help prop up the, the, the class disparity that we suffer. I mean, it's, it's, true. It, it's true. The economics that we live by have them to survive. And actually still true, even today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with all that has been made, the strides that have been made, that seems to still be present. I still see it. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and and when we talk about AIDS, there's an awful lot of people who think it's just pretty much gone away. Right. Because it's very rarely, um, I mean, in the 80s, the 90s, you couldn't ignore it. It was everywhere. In fact, especially when it jumped the barrier and straight homosexual people were being infected. Um, and, and you know, it's, it suddenly became... Um, a thing to pay attention to and as we were looking at the statistics today uh, sad to say not only has the AIDS pandemic not gone away it's alive and well and the population of people most likely to be diagnosed right now are 20 to 29 year olds that's where mm -hmm. the rate of new diagnosis is the highest and certainly in the african-american community and when we think about it being such a preventable thing yeah, and it's not all—it's not related to just sex. It's related no. to the the uh, needle exchange or the the use yes. of needles for drugs. Um, that's an important part that's being missed. Absolutely, uh, totally. It's always uh, it yes. goes beyond that, that's and right. um, it's transmitted uh, uh, to children. That's right. Uh, through the mother's right. milk, sort of thing, and that yeah. usually comes from infected needles yeah. and drugs. That's and right. So since the early 1990s. Everything you needed to know about transmission was known. You knew the fluids that the virus would live in. Um, we all knew that doorknobs, toilet seats, that Did was not, not do transmission. It. This was a this was not a this was not a virus like the common cold. It do, did not survive outside the body. It needed a body temperature to survive, which um, which meant that you know if you coughed, no um, saliva. The virus would not survive. So we knew how it was transmitted, and there was all sorts of information out there on universal precautions. But um, when I look at these numbers, I feel s kind of sad that it seems to become somewhat invisible. So why why is it invisible now? I mean, wh what? I don't know. Um, I mean, part of what um, 
what I, I think is that it's not regarded as an epidemic anymore. Um, this is an email I got from one of our friends who we hoped was going to be on the show, but he wasn't available today, that there are drugs that keep people who are positive undetected and drugs that keep people from transmitting. And um, so people are seeing this now as just a chronic disease like diabetes. They're not seeing it as a death sentence that we saw back in the 80s and 90s. It's also worth noting, I think, with, um, with popular culture, at least, it's not as, as common uh, because of the fact that a lot of where it's happening the most is particularly in more disadvantaged populations, uh, both in the U.S. and in the, the, the world abroad. Right. It's, it's mostly... Sub-Saharan Africa. Yeah. So yeah. it, 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 you know, typically, like most things in the world, people don't really care about it when it affects those people. Right. But I will say, I'd like to just ma mention one more statistics about transmission. In the South, has the highest newly diagnosed trans rate among, um, and this is a rate among 100,000 people. So it's not pure numbers, it's rate. And the South, its southern region is the highest. Right. With with a number that does disproportionately affect uh, black people as well. Yes, That's correct. So um, it tells me that we still need to really have this in people's faces and be doing education. Can is it okay if I uh, read this other part from from our friend real quick, just to yeah. give their perspective a little bit? This okay. was a, a, l a bit about. Um, we asked a friend of ours who's a, a local activist in the uh, queer and trans community to give us a little bit of insight about what that movement's like. And what he wrote was, uh, uh, Rain is, is his name, priorities have shifted towards things that affect the most marginalized of the LGBT community, like prison abolition, combating gentrification, and white supremacy, both outside and within our own communities. Another big part of the story is the revolution of gender and working to disrupt the gender binary, both systemically and on a day-to-day -day experiential level. We're also trying to uphold networks of support, both financial and otherwise, for trans and queer people who need it the most. The whole marriage equality success, which represents one of the, quote, biggest accomplishments for white, cisgendered, middle-class, liberal gays, is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the discussion of the liberation of queer people. There are a lot of amazing organizations across the U.S. working towards that vision. I feel nowadays it's less about what individual activists are doing and more about what's happening across networks. One I can think of immediately that is super relevant right now is the Queer Kitchen Brigade, a group in New York City that is working to deliver freshly canned foods and seeds to Puerto Rico, as well as raise awareness about the agroecology movement. Okay. So it, it's really good to hear that there are still people who are incredibly active and are very well aware of, um, of what's going on. We, um, we did a little research into the situation of gays in the military and about gay marriage. And um, the it's, it's kind of ironic because as you're looking to have equality, does that mean equality to be able to go off and kill? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think that's actually a really good point that's brought up here is that it's like typically when we speak about equality, it's often so much brought into the context of like of the society we're living in, right. which is inherently unequal. So right. like we, we when we want un equal opportunity, it means dismantling the entire system of uh, yep. disparity which exists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, some of this, though, is because to assimilate means to become like those other right. people. Yeah. And if they're going off to kill people in other countries and that sort of thing and That's I right. can't go. To me, that would be a good thing, but I understand if you want to assimilate and be considered part of right. the society, that's assimilation. I yes. don't particularly like that or support that, but that's what happens. That's right. And we have a great quote from um, about a gay person going off to kill and how the military treated him. I, I don't have it up. Oh, okay. When I was in the military, they gave me a medal for killing two men and a discharge for loving one. That's right. So um, I don't think we need to now send there. That was an inscription the on their gravestone. Yes, that was an inscription. He actually died of AIDS, and that was an inscription put on, on his, his, uh, on his gravestone. Uh, he didn't yes. want his name on there with it, though, but it did go. They put yeah. his name at the foot of the, yeah. the grave. Oh, wait, uh, this is Leonard Mat Matlevich. Matlevich. Yes. Matlevich. Yeah, he was, uh, yeah. Uh, with, yeah. There has never been a time ever where there were not gays in the military. Ever. That's right. You know, to the thought that somehow you you can't be a 
soldier and be gay is, is uh, right. ironic because I'm many right. of the it's greatest ridiculous. leaders and generals in the world were always, or they were gay. And uh, they they just seem to kind of, as long as you hide it, it's okay. Don't Don't say it out loud. And I don't understand why that is. If you're going to be part of something, right. you have to accept that whole. That's right. And be that's a part right. of it. You're not going to ever really have a society that's fair for everyone if you don't, don't look right. at it that way. That's right. And the other issue that I don't think we have to spend a lot of time on is gay marriage. And my understanding of gay marriage is that it was people who really wanted to, I don't know, have, have the civil protections of a marriage and also the tax benefits and other kinds of things. Mm-hmm that they felt they were being left out by not having access. I to told it. you the story of the man in uh, California. He and his partner had lived together for 40-something years. Yeah. And he was dying. It wasn't AIDS, but he was yeah. dying. Yeah. And all at once, his family, who he had never talked to for 40 years, they completely didn't, they just ignored him. He didn't exist mm-hmm. anymore. Right. But when he was dying and they learned he was dying, they were there. They prevented this man who'd lived with him. They'd been through so much together for all these years from even seeing him. That's so he right. couldn't be, he had to sit outside in the lobby of the hospital. He couldn't that's go right. into the room. I ever saw him again until he was dead. Yeah, and that's that's a very sad and situation. And that was the, one of the rights that he felt that's after right. 40 and years of being together. And yeah, inheritance and, laws. And, and yeah, all, all sorts of things. And, and, and so people, people who choose to be married, who want to, they now can. And um, that is an advancement. After a very long and hard, bitter fight. Very long and hard. And there's still a ways to go. There's still a road to travel. We were looking at some statistics today about um, workplace anti-discrimination laws. (laughs) Only 19 states prevent workplace prevent workplace discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. Three additional states prevent discrimination based on sexual um, orientation only. 24, including Georgia, have no anti-discrimination laws. In fact, yes. In the state of Georgia, you can be fired for almost anything, but especially if you're gay. That's right. Yeah, we're, as we've talked about before, a right-to-work state, which means you're the own, the boss has the right to fire you for any reason. They can. That's they right. Can just That's say. right. There's also um, this thing now happening in states, liberty state laws, allowing businesses to deny service to LGBT individuals based on religious beliefs. And I just want to let you know, there is, a, according to what I read, there's a law now advancing in Georgia to do just right, that. Do exactly so that. we yes. really need to do some homework and find out about that. Um, and and housing. The fair housing law that was passed in 1968 does not include household composition as a protected class. So people can be discriminated against um, for being you know, gay, lesbian, LG, LBGT, any, any category that is still, ex- is, is still legal. So are there any last words we want to say? We have two minutes. We have a couple minutes left. Yeah, mine is still on the military, you know, you because we have okay. to, uh, for some reason, this group of people, political group, and I won't mention who they are at this point in time, they want to take on causes and challenges, but they don't want to really be yeah. fully committed to it. Yeah. So we get these half, I can't say that word, but these half measures or half steps, like we got during the Clinton era with the don't ask, don't right. tell. Doesn't solve right. the problem. No. In fact, the decree, you had... You had, if, you, if you're if you going to war and you are a soldier and you're doing your job and you're doing it well, there's no reason to fire you to... Uh, uh, That's uh, right. To In fact, discharge when you. we were talking this afternoon, Phoenix, you told us about this individual who had been a former former military, had, had intervened oh. to save the life of Gerald Ford, and it... it um, Somehow it got some press, and he was identified as being gay. Oh, Harvey Milk outed him to the world, actually. Oh, it was okay. kind of messed up. Is that what up. happened? Okay. Yeah. Uh, All Oliver right. Sipple was the name of this person. It's a okay. brilliant story. Radio Lab did a thing on it. Definitely recommend okay. people look into that. All right. All right. Yeah. So um, I will say that we did see some very powerful. Yes. Well, World War II, for instance. I want to go to the, to the, the. All right. World War II was not won by D-Day or by any of that sort of thing. It was won by several events, one That's of right. which was the Russians. They actually did. And then one more, Alan Turing, who was gay, yeah. who actually uh, the solved the mystery of the Enigma yeah, machine and had not been for that, 
we still might be fighting. Okay. So before we sign off, I would just like to let you all know, Friday is World AIDS Day. There will be an event here in Savannah at the Savannah LGBT Center, 1515 Bull Street at 4 p.m. I think it's really important that we that make we sure that AIDS is still a presence in our lives. People are still becoming infected, suffering through the horrors of that disease and dying. And the more we can do to educate people, the better. And also to support the local LBG. Yes. So yeah, yeah. you are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with Global Soul. Thank you for listening.